Welcome to the Niche Pursuits podcast. Today we are joined by Jackie Chow with Indexy. Jackie is a current uh, website builder, also runs an SEO agency. He has a portfolio of around 35 different websites. And uh, we get to dive deep into Jackie's history, but also into his current business and how he's running his portfolio of websites. Uh, we spend most of the time talking about his portfolio of sites, but he's had a lot of success previous to that uh, in drop shipping, uh, Amazon, FBA, still runs a private label brand. We do talk about that and some of the success he's having, some of the, the th uh, exits he's had along the way. But we do spend the bulk of the time talking about website building uh, and website building at scale. Now, we've, we've touched on this topic a couple different times on the podcast of late. And Jackie brings a very different approach. And so you get to learn a lot about what website building at scale looks like. Jackie, I would say, buys most of his sites rather than starting them on his own. We talk about what to look for in a starter site, the different things he's trying to do once he gets a starter site, his approach to content, certainly how he manages content at scale, but also his approach to link building, uh, the types of links he builds um, and, uh, and the way that he goes about it. I hit him with uh, some rapid fire questions to get his insights on things like video, uh, site speed, uh, EAT, and a couple other factors. He certainly has a lot of data that he has access to because of the number of sites he has in his portfolio. So we get a lot of insights that come from someone who has a lot of information. I think maybe most prominent to me, and I talk about this at the very end of the interview, Jackie has this really great framework in terms of how he thinks about where he puts his time, where he puts his energy, where he puts his portfolio, where he puts his money and his investments. And he really underscores in all the facets of the conversation how important diversification is and risk mitigation is. And I think it's a really healthy topic for us to hear about for all of us who are uh, building assets online. And that's really, at the end of the day, kind of the central core of this podcast. It is a bit of a risky game that we have here with everything from Google updates to Amazon commission changes and the like. And Jackie really does a good job giving us a framework to think about risk mitigation. All in all, definitely worth a listen, whether you're building sites at scale or not. As I like to say, you can always learn something from someone who's building sites at scale. Enjoy. All right, welcome back to the Niche Pursuits podcast. My name is Jared Bauman. Today, I am joined by Jackie Chow with Indexy. Jackie, welcome. Good to be here. Good to have you on board. This is going to be a journey down pretty much, I mean, I don't want to say every side hustle, online marketing approach and, and whatnot, but you've been had your hands in almost everything, I feel like. So I'm really looking forward to hearing not only all about your backstory, but what you're working on right now. And uh, you got a lot of success happening right now. Why don't you give us a little bit of backstory and we'll kind of dive into some of the specifics along the way. Yeah. I document a lot of my uh, successes on Twitter as well as a ton of failures. So uh, it's definitely not all uh, rainbows and butterflies on my end, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, to give you a bit more backstory, I'm a electrical engineer by education. Figured I should probably I'm, i was going to be a terrible engineer failed a ton of courses eventually i think a day before a, a, a final exam that which i failed i googled how to make money online and then the rest was history i did everything i could to make money online it was ranged from like terrible like cpl offers all the way to selling linkedin recommendations on fiverr so that's how i got started what year is this that you, uh, you, you decided electrical engineering wasn't quite the right path for you? <laughs> yeah, I think it was like 2015 or 2016. So I'm not okay. that, um, I'm, I'm not that 10 year, uh, SEO veteran that we see. It's okay. It's okay. We'll forgive you, especially when, when yeah. you start sharing about some of the things you're doing. I think, uh, I think everyone will forgive you. What were some of the, the first forays into, I guess maybe first successful forays into to making money online that you had, um, I mean, I'm trying to think back to 2016, 2017, there was certainly some drop shipping, a lot of Amazon stuff happening, a lot of obviously SEO and website building at that time. Yep. Yep. I think uh, my most significant like internet, internet money, so to speak, was probably drop shipping. I was sold, selling these like, what is it? They're not called, but it's like 
beads like that you, you have like what is that what are those called like it's like fashion accessories for men mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. and i would think i was just manually fulfilling on aliexpress there was no like shop buy app back then it was on wordpress i think i got like fifteen thousand in like revenue in a month and i was like this is insane and i didn't have the concept of like hiring a va back then i fulfilled everything manually by hand oh and gosh. i was like in the middle of class it was doing like i was, I was doing like hundreds of orders a day and it was uh insanity but yeah that's how i first got started probably my first piece of success online after that I had a ton of like churn and burn affiliate sites where i just like pounded it with uh pvns definitely ranked very well there's a couple thousand dollars a month they eventually tanked but yeah i figured that was like something i wanted to continue as well as drop shipping i guess we'll cover that as well so with the with the drop shipping, I mean, you're not doing drop shipping anymore. Mm-hmm. What what caused you to transition out of that? Besides mm-hmm. the fact that I don't think fashion beads are in anymore. <laughs> yeah, why I transitioned out of it? Well, we made a lot of money in it. I think uh, we had a home decor drop shipping store that was doing like 250k a month with like wow 90 percent gross margins or something like that. And we eventually sold that to a PE firm in Detroit, and it was something that we weren't proud of. You know, we were like selling pretty much garbage from China and I wouldn't be able to give it to like my parents to use. I wouldn't want them to use that, you know? So we figured this time around we do it right. And then that's why we started this like D to C uh, homeware brand called Far and Away Now, which I'm happy to share as well. Okay. So let's talk about more about that brand. So you sold off to a private equity firm. You got rid of the the chaff or the, the, the stuff you didn't like. And then you started a completely different, I guess, line of products or what? what is it? Yeah, it's like uh, Portuguese dinnerware, cutlery, as well as, uh, you know, um, I think the whole idea is like heritage products from countries that they are known for manufacturing those said products. For example, Portuguese ceramics, perhaps we're we're moving next to France. So France, like French fragrances, for example, like French scented candles. We're working, we just visited like the oldest candle manufacturer in the world. And we're going to work with them. It's like very exciting stuff. And it's like stuff I'm proud of, you know? Mm-hmm. And is this, how are you, how are you selling this product? How is this all set up? Uh, it's like private label. We find like mom and pop shops that we want to work with and then just kind of negotiate a rate as well as like nice payment terms and focus really on the storytelling and like putting these mom and pops in the spotlight and telling their story. How did you end up finding that niche that, area i mean i wouldn't even think about the you know portuguese dinnerware and and french fragrances and these like how did you go from selling i mean as you put it junk from from china and into these really highly specialized niches or you know areas we saw so from our data from the drop shipping uh the home decor from china we could see like winners in certain categories and then we focused zeroed in on it that's amazing that's amazing, and obviously the, uh, there's a demand for this, and it's it's growing well. You're you're just lining up, you know, new products as we speak. Yeah, yeah, I think we're averaging like just six figures a month in euros, with like our gross uh, margins aren't as high. I think it's like sixty five percent or something. Like that. Okay. So that's something that you're working on right now. Do you, mm-hmm. I know you have your hands in a bunch of different things. What else is on the list that you guys are tackling in today's, you know, today's environment and today's workday? We also have an SEO agency that does like mid five figures as well as a portfolio of content sites. So um, our idea behind the SEO slash content site synergy is kind of like, hey, um, we can help you rank your sites but we want to like practice what we preach. So we want to build out a portfolio and focus on what we're good at, which is ranking websites. Just putting all that profit because agency is an extremely high margin uh, business. Let's, let's be honest. So pu- putting all that profit in because I don't, I don't need all that money. Let's just say, uh, like I don't need to be spending mid five figures on, on, on my lifestyle. I'm not Neil Patel quite yet, you know? Uh, I, I can, I can put that all into content revenue generating assets and yeah, go from there. If you have a wide enough, uh, big enough portfolio, it's kind of like a risk, uh, it helps you dissipate some risk. 
a lot of people talk about the risk involved in owning a portfolio of sites, which you've kind of offset by having an agency that serves clients. And so your model mm -hmm. is, I mean, to summarize, you basically like take the profit from the agency and then which agency life is fickle. Like I run an agency as well. So it's, um, you know, obviously the goal is to streamline that client base, but you know, most people who run agencies talk about how you have some really good months some down months that year over year, you know, if you're doing it right, it kind of averages out a bit, but you're offsetting some of that risk by then putting a lot of that profit into, into a portfolio of websites. That's really, that's really sound. Yeah. I think, um, yeah. Portfolio of websites as well as like traditional investments, such as like equities, um, crypto, uh, and yeah, so yeah. And then content sites as well. That's like, I think that's our, our split right now. So I could ask this question later on, or I could just ask it now. How do you handle all this stuff on a day? Each one of these on their own sound like a, like more than a full-time job, right? You've got this product uh, line that you're building out and that sounds like a lot of work. You've got an SEO agency. That's a lot of work. You have a portfolio of websites and that's a tremendous amount of work. I mean, how do you, how do you structure all this in a way that you and your team can give all of these things the time they need? So the biggest time sink, surprisingly, is the D to C homeware site. That takes up most of my time. So like time to revenue, probably that's the worst one. Yeah, through in terms of like structuring my days. Honestly, I don't, I'm pretty, I got really good at delegating through the last couple of years. Um, I think uh, I take a lot of notes from uh, Andrew Wilkinson from tiny.com. Uh, this guy is like a great delegator. He, he's good at hiring operators for each business. So one thing I like to do is when I buy a business from someone, I would keep them on as an operator, as like a minority, uh, you know, let's say uh, owner and, you know, have some skin in the game and also keep them like motivated to continue to grow the business. And just kind of like, okay, this is your piece of the pie now. You focus on that, but I'll attach my team. Like, I'll give you my resources to grow this. How would you grow it if you had infinite amount of resources? And like, let them just like go. Because like, they're still attached to the business. They built it from the ground up. So it's simply going from, is instead of like zero to one, it's like one to, you know, a hundred. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Is that like a good analogy for how you're running some of these websites in your portfolio? Yeah, for sure. I think uh, I have four, four businesses that are about worth six figures. I just exited one, but yeah, I ha I've had four operators that I've done this with. And then I think the remain remaining 30 sites <laughs> are done in-house. Okay. So 34 sites, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot to manage. Maybe walk us through the process that you went through to get to 34. And again, I'm talking more high level. Like, was that always the goal? Was the goal to have, when you said portfolio of sites, was it some somewhere in that range? Did that happen over time? How did you end up landing on that number of sites and that sort of scale? Yeah, I don't want to make it sound like these 34 sites are all generating crazy revenue because they're not. I've only done max like from these sites, like 60K a month. Um, I, I guess in in retrospect, it's still pretty, it's quite a bit, but it's nothing like the sort of volume we get for e-commerce. But um, yeah, how do we manage that is, you know, I, we buy a lot of starter sites, we mm -hmm. pound it with lots of content and links, and then we just simply wait. I think um, in content, like with niche sites, there's a lot of waiting involved. And I just like to have, you know, you buy sites in different stages, you know, and then you implement what you think is the best practice and you wait and you see what works and what doesn't work. Maybe you can go with more aggressive and more risky tactics for the sites that are worth like 5k instead of hundred K, you know, and then if that works, maybe you can maybe then move on to your bigger sites on in the portfolio, so on and so forth. So uh, I just like to do a lot of testing and a larger portfolio enables me to do that. Mm -hmm. We had someone named uh, Ewan on the podcast uh, a month or two ago. Oh, I know. You, okay, you know you. Uh, he he kind of broke it down and said that he would start a batch of sites, put fifty or sixty percent of his budget towards these, let them sit and wait, and then pick out the winners and put the rest of his allocation into those winners. There, it sounds 
it reminded me of that, I guess, when you're talking about how you have a lot of starter sites that you wait and watch. Yeah, I think it's just um, the time it takes, you know, waiting for Google to pick it up is it, it takes too long. So you have you have to go for volume because um, there are just sites where you follow best practices and it just doesn't rank. You know, some guy can be a, an industry expert right for like months and it will just simply not rank. Uh, even with all the links in the world. But um, yeah, I think uh, I would be considered something like launching at a much smaller scale than uh, you and yeah, he is that guy does like, he does like, yeah, crazy. I don't, I don't even know how he does that. I don't, I don't think I have the mental compa- compa- capacity to do that. Yeah. Well, you guys are all on another level, but yeah, you're right. I guess we're talking 34 versus hundreds. I mean, it's mm-hmm. all big numbers to me, but yeah, he's certainly at a different scale. <laughs> Can I ask you about some of the insights that you, I guess, have gained from seeing specifically all these starter sites and maybe any patterns that people can learn from as to what can move the needle a little bit faster for people? A lot of people are in that spot where they've either started a site or they're a year in and they're, it's still crickets or it's very, very early days. Any insights for people into how to evaluate what's working and what's not in those early days, how to know when it's working, how to get it working faster. Another piece of feedback we hear is, hey, there's no feedback loop, right? Like I write 30 pieces of content, I put them live, but I don't really know what's working and what's not working. So any insights from all the the starter sites you work with? Unfortunately, like I don't like making these statements because it changes so quickly. You know, even like with the core update, I, I got tons of sites that got destroyed. And I don't even know why some of them went up. Like I've had one of my, our major ones went up, but I, I, I can't even tell you why. Because the site speed sucks, for example. Um, <laughs> links we used were the same as the ones that got hit. So it's, it's, it's really tough to say. Um, I would say in terms of content, I think you have to publish on a regular basis, but it doesn't have to be that frequent. It doesn't have to be like 10 posts a month. It could be four to five and Google will still see it as like, oh, you're still updating the site. So cool. You know, uh, as long as you don't let it sit and just let it die. I think that's the one thing I've noticed across all the sites is that you have to keep publishing. Does, have you noticed any indexing challenges? I know that's kind of all the rage with people mm-hmm. talking right now about new sites having problems with the, uh, the articles getting indexed. Mm, no, I think Rank Math has a really good plugin for that. I think mm-hmm. it was like something that uses the Search Console uh, API or something like that. That has been working great for us, as well as like you can use apps, you know, those uh, paid apps, that indexing tools. Those work like crazy. Like they're great. The the core update. I mean, you you mentioned it, so I thought I'd ask you about it. With thirty plus sites, you're pretty much just by the sheer nature of the odds, going to have some that go up and some that go down when an update like that. You mentioned how it's hard to find any patterns. Do you think that having a, a larger portfolio like kind of mitigates the risk of updates? And like, or maybe how do you guys approach updates? How do you guys think about core updates as a part of that strategy? I personally calculate payback periods as like a main metric that I run our projections on. So typically I buy sites with a payback period between two to three years. Mm. And once purchased, for example, because I'm on a custom rate card for Amazon, I, I'm able to shorten that payback period to just under two years. And as long as I can hold, like as long as it doesn't die within the two years, I'm, I'm like in the green. So for example, uh, I had a, a huge site that I hit it was doing 20K a month. But, and it, it's, just, it's currently at 3K a month. Um, but I'm already in the green because I paid like, I think it was like 60K. Uh, it was a, a like a God awful uh, 301, like non-brandable domain, like pure garbage. You know, like if, if any of the people you've had on, they, no, no one would pick that up. But I picked it up for like pennies on the dollar. So I, I'm like a risk on type of guy. I know this will get hit on the next update, but I'm going to, I'll be still in the green because I'll be making my money back. Right. So I'm like a fan of taking like these huge swings and so far has been paying off. But um, in the last couple of months, I have been bowing back a bit on the risk side just because of the economic climate. Right. Yeah. Well, at the time of recording, you know, could have a global recession or 
all sorts of different things in our hands, inflation, that sort of stuff. That makes sense. Probably a good time to ask about, I'd love your thoughts on it. Uh, a lot of us build a site, build two sites. And when we, when are asked about the long-term plans of the site, it's like, well, you know, get the income as high as I can, maybe someday sell it. At your size, is it more about the monthly income and maximizing that? Or are you more conscious of pouring as much back into those sites to grow them where the real maximum payout is what you're focused on at the time of sale? Yeah, we calculate by definitely monthly profits because these exits, especially if you're buying starter sites and trying to grow them, we're, you're taking moonshots essentially, right? You're trying to get that six figure, six to seven figure exit on these starter sites. Those are the moonshot ones. So I would buy a ton of like five to 20K sites, try to get them to 100K and then sell them. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, then, you know, if it's making 1K a month, I've already, I'm already in the green. I'm not too worried about it. If it dies, it dies. You know, it's a very different approach from the typical niche site, you know, like builder. I think it's important. I've just spoken, I just met two uh, people in the content site niche, yes, or in person. And they have like 90%, I'm pretty sure like majority of their net worth are in content sites. And that's not something I can really stomach. And I think I urge a lot of, let's say your listeners that, um, you know, to take some chips off the table once in a while, mm -hmm. because these updates like can be like life ruining, you know, because some of these people maybe only have one site and their whole family depends on it, you know? <laughs> so sometimes it's good yep. to take, to take some profits. Yes, I get it. You're making... 20k a month you're making double what your friends are earning at a full-time job you're probably on the moon you're out having fun eating expensive dinners now but that can be wiped off like the next day with a google update so i think it's just like there has to be some risk management in this industry there are lots of places to sell sites so there's no shortage of that and at you know i think that that's the argument against having one site like uh, the, the argument for it would be to be able to put all of your time and effort into it, to be able to focus, to be able to, you know, establish, uh, you know, it's talked about a lot like an authority site, right? To the level where it is quote unquote, large enough to not be as subjected to these fluctuations and these Google updates and stuff. Your counter argument makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of people struggle though with the amount of focus that clearly you're able to have and the delegation that you have. So it's tough, it's tough. Yeah, it is tough. I think it's just like a matter of sitting down and focusing. I don't see it to be that hard. I think some people probably have a bit more distractions than me because if they have like young kids, for example, it's a lot harder to focus. I'm in that camp. Yeah. <laughs> but still got to figure it out, right? You know? Yeah, so, exactly. Let's look at, uh, we don't even have, I'm guessing that with the number of sites you have, I could give you a theoretical <laughs> example and you can probably think of a site in your portfolio that matches that. But I, I kind of want to walk through maybe a more specific use case in your portfolio, let's say you grab a site that you buy for $5,000. What is a typical site look like that you buy for $5,000? And what's you know a typical roadmap for you to grow that site? I'm really curious to hear what you, you know the things you do right out of the gate. So what I'm looking for is high amount of indexed keywords on Ahrefs. The graph should be up and to the right, uh, you know, like nice trajectory. Earnings is not important at the 5 to 10K range. It does not matter. It can be making $0 and I would pay that. And what I do is I would figure out which niche I want to get into, um, see if I'm selling any products in that niche. For example, um, we have an FBA brand in the homeware niche as well in the US. So if, the, if they rank for the product we're selling, we'll buy that. It doesn't matter. You know, it doesn't matter the price, we'll buy it because we'll just push our own products. Um, kind of like what uh, VPN Mentor did, you know, uh, with North uh, or with K, the Cape brands. Other than that, it's just a bunch of keyword research after purchase, scheduling posts. Uh, if the trajectory is super strong, we do like 30 posts a month. But if it's like just our standard, you know, couple, it's like a, not a crazy vertical line, then we would probably just do, you know, five to 10 posts a month, lots of link building in the beginning, see how it reacts first, and then adjust accordingly. If it's like still mooning, then we would, yeah, just like pound the site with 
uh, content. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where are you, are you working with your content all in-house? Do you have uh, a setup there? Do you, do you work with other agencies? Yeah, we have like, I think eight to 12 writers, but we pay a flat rate for per word written for it. So they're contractors. And then we have four editors, um, editors, which means they upload and design the posts as well as like, you know, check the content for readability uh, issues, you know, um, following our standard, uh, our, our SOPs. And then I have a director of ops who's like handling just about everything for me, mm -hmm. going from like content sites all the way to agency side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You ever run into, you know, some months uh, you have to kind of load balance. Like we want to put 25 articles on this site, but you know, given the way the team is structured, we're not able to put 25 articles on that side. Like how do you kind of prioritize where to put their time on a daily or, or monthly basis? Yeah. Depends on how the sites are doing. So if they're, if they're hit by the core update, I'm, I'm t I told them to like pause all the articles We're we're fixing up the existing ones before we move on to new articles. And for the sites that are doing well, I, we like double down on them. So for example, we had one site doing like, I think it was like 20 articles a month. And I've asked our, the team to like double that because mm -hmm. it's doing well now. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, link building, you know, what kind of link building are you, are you doing for most of these sites? Are, are you seeing a certain type work better than others? Uh, you know, I mean, obviously at, at, at the number of sites you have, you probably have some insights that most of us would not get from one, two, three or four, you know, websites. Yeah. So we're, we're always testing, right? Um, because that's a way to uh, manage risk as well. Because uh, and a lot of people don't actually do this is you're supposed to implement different link building tactics for each site. Because if you follow the same, uh, you, if you have an SOP for link building, then if a core update hits, all, it's going to hit all of your sites essentially. If it's like a link update, yep. Because you're following the same one. If you're, for example, you can't do all niche edits across all your domains. If you get slapped, it's like it's like a complete wipeout. You're like so. We try to split things up. The churn and burn sites, PVNs are still working great. A lot of niche edits, a lot of guest posts. And if I'm feeling a bit more dangerous on some of the sites, I would build like tier two links as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would you call P PBNs or tier two links more dangerous these days? Definitely PBNs. Tier two has, like, I, in my opinion, have never been like uh, algo penalized. Yeah. Yet. Yet. Fair, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and for those listening who maybe don't know much about tier one, tier two link building, tier one would be, hey, you're building a guest post. You place a guest post on a website and that website links to your site. That would be a tier one link. But then a tier two link would be, and correct me if I'm saying this wrong, at least from the, from the way you're doing it, but you, you build that guest post that does link to your site, but then you're going to send a lot of links to that guest post, which will prop up the value or the link juice from that that guest post or that tier one link. Yeah, exactly. And like for these guest posts, we're trying to target the same keyword in our money site keyword. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. For example, if we're linking to a best SEO company article that the guest post would try to rank for like, for example, top SEO agency 2022. And then we would try to rank that guest post site. It's kind of like Parasite SEO, but mm -hmm. we're also linking to our own site. Yep. Type of thing. Yeah. 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 And, and, and typically when you're doing tier two link blend, you, you want to do it on really, you want to point those to really powerful domains. So mm -hmm. that would make sense to similarities there. Um, when you talked about the need to, to build different ways when it comes to links for different sites, uh, is that like, is that complex? How do you solve that complexity? And again, I'm trying to think of maybe someone who has one or two sites, uh, they could learn a lot from different types of links and trying and testing and the complexities that get involved in that. How do people think through that? How do you think through the complexities of that? I think uh, it sounds complex, but it's really not. Um, it's more like, okay, this site we do niche edits, this site guest posts, this site blended, this site PBNs. And you just remember that. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe you write it down on a piece of paper. It's, it's not that bad. Um, with someone with like one or two sites, Let's let's not do PBNs, you know. Yeah. <laughs> if uh, if it means putting food, if it's the site that puts food on the table, let's not do these risky tactics. Let's not do tier two links, you know. Maybe um, 
guest posts and it's hyper relevant sites because uh i know people for example mushfiq from the website flip talked about it he only builds like hyper relevant links he doesn't he doesn't build anything else you know so i know people who have found success like that i personally don't do that i i believe uh quantity over qual like hyper quality let's just say that um yeah, because Google doesn't really penalize links nowadays. They just ignore it instead. Ignore yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe there's a, maybe there's three classes of links. There's like the really good links, like maybe the kind mm -hmm. you referenced Mushfiq building, uh, who we've had in the podcast mm -hmm. a couple of times. Then there's the really bad links, which are ones that could get you caught up, could be bad, might just get ignored. And then there's links that kind of go down the middle. They might not be the best links for your niche mm -hmm. but they're certainly not flagging or or bad yeah yeah exactly um so i tend to be in in, in the middle you know in the middle and then if i'm feeling like risky then probably on the bottom but <laughs> I mean, well because those really good links risk. are really hard to build right especially if it's something you're not as much of an expert in you know i mean uh mm -hmm. that, that 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 makes a lot of sense have you connected any of these link building patterns to sites that were hit in the core update versus sites that weren't is there any patterns that have emerged there uh the recent update i can say with pretty high certainty it's not a link building update yeah i would say like very very high certainty um yeah i think for me personally the sites that were hit the hardest were the ones that i um reversed a previous penalty with like a 301 and those were now like completely decimated. But you know, I re recovered some, already made my money back, can't really complain. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I know the name of the game, it's a high risk uh, industry. Yeah. Let's, um, let me take a step back and maybe look at your portfolio of sites from a 10,000, 20,000 foot view. Um, what are, uh, for someone who is, has one or two sites and aspires over the next year or two to, go from one or two to a portfolio, maybe not 35 or whatever your number is, but maybe from one to five or from three to 10. What are some kind of high level tips you can give people who want to go from being a single site operator to having a portfolio of sites? Sure. I think uh, I wouldn't want to give any advice unless I knew their financial situation. So let's say the, this person has, you know, 5k in the bank and they have a site making 1k a month i would say sell that right now <laughs> take the money rebuild the sites and you're gonna re you're gonna be writing the site like you're gonna be writing the content yourself whereas someone with like 100k in the bank with a site making 1k a month i would say hey you can start buying some you can buy some starter sites you know uh, so it really depends on their financial situation everyone's different because yeah a site making 1k a month is worth at least 30k you don't want your too much of your net worth to be caught up in a high risk asset asset like this that can go to zero it, it, the the nature of starter sites and buying them it sounds like you're really mm -hmm. bullish on that because you kind of shorten that time frame to which you can move the needle on this site um mm -hmm. how like are you also starting your own sites your own starter sites and then letting them age or are you pretty much just buying starter sites now mm -hmm. Let me think when the last time I started my own site was. Yep. The fact you're having the to think about time, it. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 like a year or two at least. Yeah. So it's not it's not recent. That's a lie. I have I have I have one right now. Um six month old mental health niche. Yeah. It's uh it's going well. So yeah, I, I do that. I do that. Not often, not often okay. at all. I I rather buy. Yeah. Because like I think uh depends on the financial situation once again. Like 5k a month is a, a smaller percentage of my net worth than someone else. So if it's 5k a month to save months of time, then we take those all day, all day and every day. Yeah. Where do you find uh starter sites? Like where, where do you where do you get those? Yeah, um Facebook groups are great. Um I get offered a ton from private deals. This is why I'm actually on the podcast. I get great deal flow from this. Lots of people offer sites to me um, when I appear on podcasts. So please send me a DM with a 
your site. <laughs> we'll be buying them. And yeah, I think mostly private deals now. Before I would be posting on Facebook groups, but now most people would message me before they list anywhere else. You talked about when you looked at starter sites, like, hey, I want to see keywords going up under the right. I really don't care if they're making money. <clears throat> Again, putting myself in the shoes of someone who's saying, okay, I, I built my site, but I want to go out and buy a starter site now. And mm -hmm. I remember the first time I bought a site, there's so much trepidation behind it. <laughs> um, and I remember actually listening to uh, Mushfiq's podcast interview a couple, from a couple of years ago here on this podcast. And he kind of talked about some of the things to look at in buying sites that, that helped a lot. Um, what are the things uh, you, know, you want to make sure you look for when you're buying a starter site, uh, maybe a certain age or, a, you know, uh, these, these other things you might be looking at? Yeah. I, my due diligence is not as thorough as Mushfiq's. I've seen what he does. Uh, mine is, I throw into Ahrefs. Um, if we're talking strictly starter sites, so I only throw into Ahrefs. I can make an offer immediately, I think within five minutes, and I can go into escrow within half an hour, and the funds will be ready. So like I, I push for a speed. That's why people actually sell to me, because... I, I move a lot quicker than someone who's going to be like, oh, let me take a look at GA. I don't really need to take a look at GA. Uh, search console at most. I don't really need to see anything because um, I would maybe put like the rankings from Ahrefs into my own ranking tracker. Uh, I'm, I move a lot quicker than some of these people. So I just need Ahrefs and verifying it on search console. That's it. Okay. I'm going to switch gears to now the, we were, we've been talking about starter sites and how to start a portfolio and all that. I'm going to switch gears and go to the other end of the spectrum, which is selling sites. How mm -hmm. for you, do you evaluate when to sell a site versus when to keep growing it? Um, any insights from you on when to sell? Do you sell sites only when they're on the uptick or do you wait for a plateau and then sell? Do you sell sites certain quarters of the year to maximize revenue? How do you determine when to sell and what are some of the qualifiers that go into it for you? Yeah, I think uh, best time to sell a site is also the best time to sell your stocks or crypto. It's like at the moment of like peak euphoria, when you think you are like, nothing can hurt you. Um, that's, that's pretty much the time you should sell. When you think you're like on top of the world, you're the best in the industry at this, you should probably sell, you know, <laughs> when, uh, yeah, I think. I, I learned this from like trading crypto and stocks a lot. Um, this is something I I've have not done perfectly on the niche sites because it's not as liquid in this industry. But um, yeah, I think it's when you're when you think you don't need to sell, that's when you should sell. And when it takes up too much of your net worth, you should sell. So that's uh, my my general rule of thumb. Take some so money off the table. Always, yeah. And it doesn't have to be 100% of, like, I'm happy to buy sites, like 70% of your site, and you can have 30%, there's still upside for you, you know, um, and you get to keep a lot of cash, and maybe go pay down your loans, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's, it's a great time to take some profits. It's interesting. Uh, we've probably all been there. Those of us who have a mm -hmm. website that's on the uptick, and you're right. You're thinking, man, the sky's the limit for this. Clearly, Google loves what I'm doing. I'll just yeah. keep doing more of it. Uh, and then obviously, when your site's in the downturn from an update or from something like that, or even when it flattens out, when it plateaus, not any update specific, but just because sites plateau, you start thinking, man, I should have taken my money off the table, maybe. Maybe yeah. I should have sold it at that point. Maybe I should have diversified. These are the questions that run through my mind right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you, you, these aren't thoughts at, like that. You, you don't think about these things at all when it's like when your rankings are flying. You never think about this. You're just thinking about, oh, how else can I grow this? How else can I push the revenue higher? You never think about the downside, which is like a huge mistake people make. I don't have it in front of me, but I, I would imagine that for someone who is heavily involved in websites <laughs> with the May core update of 2022, and also potentially heavily involved in crypto with a lot of the downturns that happened over spring and summer. It's probably a very disheartening time for people who had a lot in both camps. <laughs> yeah, it's like a triple whammy with like a stocks, core update, and crypto. And then we got um, inflation on the backside of that. <laughs> yeah, no, no one's winning here. Uh, yeah.
definitely hurting a lot. How much are you doing in your portfolio of sites in some of the maybe secondary things that move the needle? And I'm going to throw some things out there. None of these <laughs> things necessarily, all SEOs will agree, help. Many will debate them. So I don't, I'm not trying to create a debate here about what does and doesn't move the needle. I'm just trying to get your thoughts in general at a portfolio level. Um, site speed, uh, video, uh, custom imagery, uh, expertise, as it maybe relates to that eat conversation. Where do some of these things enter into your portfolio? Um, so it really depends on the niche. If you're in homeware, no one cares about if you're an interior designer or not. I think we write, I, I've I prompted our writers to write from the point of view that we've used it and that's helped rankings. And site speed is definitely important on a conversion level. So if it takes too long to load, no one's clicking your affiliate links. That's the I, I've learned that firsthand and I've, I've seen that because of e -com. So sites that take more than two seconds to load, no one's waiting for that, especially on mobile. And they're out, they're not even logged into like their Wi-Fi. They're on like 4G outside. You know, if it takes too long, they're not waiting. Um, so site speed is important. Uh, expertise is not so important in certain niches, but let's say if you're in the VPN niche and you're trying to do something, you're searching, you're about to do something illegal, you know, like buy drugs on the internet or something like that. They do, they try, probably double check that you're like a cybersecurity expert or something like that. Uh, whereas, yeah, home niche is fine. Um, what, what else did you mention? Uh, these uh, growth yes. levers that you- Video. Speed. Video. Video is great to have. I haven't been able to implement it properly. I think that's extremely important actually. And it's great for uh, EAT if you believe it or not. So I guess that's what you meant about ex expertise. But yeah, video is great. You should, if I could, for example, uh, for our VPN sites, It'd be great if I could make like a how-to video for each article, you know, especially our one, the ones that rank for best VPN. Yeah, that'd be great. It's a good idea. I should probably do that. But <laughs> right now we've been just uh, embedding like other people's videos and hey, yeah. this guy liked it, you know, type of thing. Yep. Yeah. Well, don't take it from me. I'm just asking. <laughs> not not advising, <laughs> but yeah. curious. Certainly videos seem to make a big, uh, make a big impact on sites from the, the May update. And since we've been talking a lot about the May update, <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah, yeah. I would imagine at scale videos hard to pull off videos hard in general, but at, I would, I would think that a single site operator or someone who is doubled down on one site would actually have a competitive advantage in creating video because, you know, they know the content so well at scale with teams of writers writing different contents that that's gotta be hard to pull off video. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, uh, heavily niche dependent as well for yeah. example i think um one example is my brother who's like pretty big on tiktok like 300k followers anytime he writes a recipe and if he embeds his tiktok video in there i think google's able to tell that he actually made this recipe and like the rankings just fly every time he posts it just flies up zero zero links site is crap um <laughs> backlink profile is also crap but it just ranks for some reason you know, and these are extremely competitive terms. Like there's keywords like best air fryer. He doesn't rank for that, but I've seen examples of like friends who are also big influencers. They just like talk from the POV that they're, they've used it and then they make a video out of it and it just ranks once they embed it. Wow. Um, so I think, yeah, I think there's something there. I think Google's like uh, natural language processing is pretty good now they, that they, they can figure it out. The YouTube API gives a lot of clues about mm. how much they actually know about every video you create. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't remember, I won't start referencing some of the things because it's it's been about a year or so since I, I saw some of the details on it, but it was fascinating. Like they could tell if you're recording in front of the Eiffel Tower, they could tell it was the mm -hmm. Eiffel Tower. They would be able to note that you're in Paris, France. They'd be able to know more about it. It was very fascinating to see them do that at that scale. It's not just processing words anymore. It's understanding a lot of depth there. It's really crazy. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Let me, as we start to kind of bring it back here and, and wind down a bit, I, I'm just, I'm really curious maybe what a day in the life looks like for you. Maybe, you know, could you walk us through a day in the life of, of how you do balance? I know we've bounced around a lot, so I'm kind of coming back to maybe productivity and that sort of thing, but I do want to hear 
uh, you keep saying things like, well, I think if you just, you just got to do it. <laughs> you just got to sit yeah. down and, and do it. Well, how do you, what does the day look like? Like, how do you do it? And, and maybe there's some insights there without you even realizing mm. it. <laughs> yeah. I think, um, I think now I'm at the point where I'm putting in normal hours. So like four to eight hours a day, it's not anything crazy anymore, but when on the come up, so on the come up, I was busting out like 16 to 18 hour days every day for the, wow. in, like, for example, in COVID, um, I had nothing else better to do. I was in front of the computer 16 to 18 hours a day. I had like severe carpal tunnel syndrome. It was, it was like, I, my arms were paralyzed. Uh, yeah. Um, so how, what, what I, what would happen is I would wake up every day, put out the fires that started when I was sleeping. Um, get a workout in afterwards, eat something, have some coffee, you know, uh, think about what you need to do afterwards while you're working out, maybe listen to a podcast and then, yeah, just implementation comes after the coffee and you just like knock out the things like maybe you would want to, depends on your hours, but like knock out the five things you, you dreaded, um, from the day before, you know, just do that. Cause if you're even like 1% better than the day before, it compounds like pretty greatly. So that's pretty much what happened. The um, it's interesting to, to hear about, again, I, I'll say this every other podcast <laughs> episode this year, I feel like it's 2022. And I feel like we're really having so many people on this year that talk about so much of what they're, where they're at right now is on the back of what they did with their time during COVID, at least on the early parts of it. And so it sounds like you were able to just make, really effective use from a business standpoint, maybe not as much mm -hmm. fun, but from a business standpoint, you really use that time to just put your head down and go and go and go and go. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was extremely lucky on several fronts though. Um, I caught like some great investments. Um, I bought sites when everyone was scared during COVID, you know, when I think it was like March, uh, when stocks were like drilling into the floor. Um, that's when I bought a ton of sites fire sale. I'm ready to do that. Um, if, or if, and when the recession comes. Uh, so I think it's just a lot of luck, but also you have to be ready when the time comes. Let's just say that very general and cliche, but yeah. Well, it could be, you know, I mean, all this is cyclical. So like you said, if a recession mm -hmm. does come again, people could have those somewhat similar opportunities potentially, even if it's just, uh, you know, getting laid off from a job and having a couple of months of unemployment and, uh, you know, knuckling down and putting that time to good use or something like there's a lot of scenarios that could come in the future for people who get the inspiration from all these COVID stories and, and people put their head down. So, yeah, um, but there's also a, uh, sorry. No, go ahead. Um, I, I want, this is one point I really want to hammer in. Um, there's a survivorship bias for sure. So you don't see the people who failed because no one wants to get them on as podcast guests. Um, but yeah, p please don't like quit your full-time job right now with zero money in the bank. You know, you should have at least 12 months leeway and you should have a site that's already generating revenue. So like, don't quit your job and like start a site from scratch. That's ir irresponsible. Mm -hmm. And it's bad for your family as well. Please don't do that. Yeah. And we'll put lots of stress on everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you mentioned, uh, that you're in the buying mood and that, uh, now is, did you mention Twitter is the best way to get in touch with you? Maybe share some of your contact information so people can mm -hmm. uh, follow along with you. I've been following you on Twitter for a while now and, um, mm -hmm. I do enjoy and get value out of what you tweet. I didn't know you were buying though. Maybe I'll send you over a few of my, uh, mm -hmm. my websites here, but <laughs> what's, uh, what's the best way for people to keep up with you? Um, definitely Twitter, um, at Indexy, I -N -D -E -X -S -Y. Um, I respond to most DMs unless they're, how do I start a new site? But yeah, I would, I would, would, would respond to most DMs and yeah, or my email or a contact form on index.com would work as well. Okay. Really good. This has been, man, we ping ponged a lot. So I, yeah. I know, which is good. It's not bad, by the way. Uh, I, I say that because I, I, I feel like I want to go back and re-listen to this on my own accord, just to kind of glean some of the things we were talking about. Uh, again and take more notes. But I, I love your strategy about how you're balancing 
the risk and the reward that comes with the different things you're involved in. And I think, I guess I just want to underscore that as we close, you're involved in a lot of different mm -hmm. things, but it, there, it really does seem to be built on this platform of having a strategy underneath it all for risk mitigation and for making sure that you aren't overly uh, influenced into one section of business or one section of websites or one mm -hmm. section of link building or one, you know, like you're very good at that. And I think there's a lot people could learn from an overarching standpoint that I really got out of this, this interview today. Yeah, for sure. And all this is uh, from being a degenerate crypto trader, you know. I guess that would do it to you, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. My skin is extremely hard. Yeah. <laughs> Very hard at this point. Well, with that, um, we'll close. Uh, Jackie, thanks so much. It's been great. And um, uh, I hope to hear, I hope in a couple of years we're going to have you on, we can hear more about how this portfolio of yours is doing um, and uh, maybe hear some, some more success stories. But thanks for coming on and sharing today. Perfect. Thanks for your time.